Life is short. You must live every day as if it's going to be your last. Pop me up. Let's do rank. That's exactly how I used to live. Until... When must I bring you from the zoo, mommy? I became a baby mom. Hey, ladies. We slay. Mm, all day. Mm. Hey, baby. Don't come here with your cheek flattered and why are you so angry? You know what you need to do? This part of your body, you need to use it to get laid. <laughs> get laid. Who says I am not getting laid? <laughs> Boutique hotel oh. somewhere. Hey. <laughs> What's this, Santa? A pregnancy test skin and it's positive. I'm still young and there's things I want to do. There's these new sneakers coming out. I just expected more from someone who was raised by a single mother. I still love you. And I know that you like me. But I want you to love me again. Girl. I was with Caesar. Eh? Same Caesar who kicked you out of the house in the middle of the night. He's better. And did you go? Would you rather your child goes to bed hungry and Tutuko? Of course not, Sandy, but that's not... I don't earn enough money. I'll see you in court. Court? Sandy! Hello? Keenan! Hey, you hung up. Caesar, baby, your phone's ringing. You have no business going through my phone. Get the hell out of my house right now. I truly believe that there's good men out there. They are, and they're all after toilet. Michael! Maybe we can grab a bite together. When are you guys kissing? Who <gasps> says we haven't already? You are such an embarrassment. Is that how you got pregnant with Seppo? With a peck on the cheek? I'm going to keep the baby. Okay. Maybe we can have a weekend away. Road trip. Road trip. You know you want Road trip. Road trip. Road trip. Yeah. No matter what they say, girl, I promise I'll love you forever, every night and day. Girl, you call on my world like a rain. To the amazing woman in my life. May we find true love. May we appreciate it once we have it. And may we never, ever, ever settle for less. Thank you, guys. I love you. Please don't deprive yourself of a sex life because of that baby uh, that's growing in your baby. Do it. Thank and you, don't John. make another one. Warning that, Aman.
Hi, everybody. Hi, ladies. So today is the first masterclass of the Women's Month, right, which is powered by the Gauteng Film Commission, known as the GFC. So I'll be facilitating today's talk. And my name is Naledi Buhaju, right? So before we go any further, please keep in mind that these masterclasses will be happening from today up until the 18th of August. So please be in the loop, be on the lookout for them because they are amazing, amazing speakers from our industry who will be sharing all their experiences with us on these platforms. So today we are discussing and celebrating women who have broken the barriers in this industry, right? Amazing, amazing women with me today. And we're speaking entrepreneurship. We're speaking sustaining ourselves in the industry. We're speaking the future of women in this film and television industry. So let me introduce my people. I'm sure you can see all of them and you're excited. So the first person I'll introduce is Doretta Neal, right? So Doretta is a powerhouse. She is skilled in various, like a lot right, of sectors within our industry. And she has worked on stage in front of the camera and behind the camera. So this is somebody who's going to be sharing a lot, a lot of experience with us from when she broke in up until where she's actually going. Then the second person who's being about multi-talented, Miss Triple Thread, Miss Jack of All Trades, you name it, right? We are speaking to Salamina Mosese. So welcome, Salamina. Uh, and then lastly, but not least, we have one of the very few. And when I say very few, I mean like very rare, like it doesn't happen, right? We have a female film director, guys, a female film director with us, Stefina Zwane. And she has worked in TV, in advertising, in film. You just wonder how in such a male dominated industry, right? So these are the women I'm with today and we will be discussing our industry and how incredible it has been, how difficult it has been, how to beat the challenges with that we face and where we're going as an industry. So welcome ladies, how are you today? Hi Naledi, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. Yes, so I'll start with Salamina, right? So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and why you chose this industry? And then from Salamina, we'll go to Doretta, and then Doretta just pitch in that as well, and then Stefina. So you go, Salamina. Cool. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I think I was a regular kid who loved to watch TV. Um, at the time we were growing up, kids TV was a big deal still, especially the variety programs. Um, and I didn't necessarily dream of being on TV as such. I just knew it was something that really interested me. So I like to say that the industry chose me because um, it so happened that um, my mom saw an advertisement for a new agency that was starting in Midrand, which is where I grew up. And she decided to keep me and my siblings out of trouble, that we should join this agency, see it seems like they like TV, maybe this will keep them busy going to auditions, et cetera. And so started my um, love affair with this industry. Um, um, so my first job was as a kids um, actress on Soul Buddies, which was an edutainment series um, that actually became very, very popular. Um, but you know, for me, it was life changing in the sense that it made me realize that I had actually always wanted to be in the industry. I just, I'd never a thought about how you start, where you would join. It just wasn't in my orbit until I started on Soul Buddies. Um, and then after that, many other jobs came. Um, and then really the decision to go behind the scenes came many, many years after. Um, and that was after I met this incredible woman who's in the other window, Stefina. Um, we met in high school when we were both kids TV presenters. And by the time Varsity came, we had dreams of owning our own production company. And that of course only came many, many years later. So that's the summarized version. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dorita. Uh, it seems we all came a long way, hey, to get where we are. Uh, yes, I also, I started acting um, when I was very young. But at some point, I kind of got bored with one, waiting for the phone to ring, and two, playing the dumb blonde, because that was it. <laughs> I was always the one running around in my underwear, hiding <laughs> from the, the wife. The, you know, and at some point, you kind of go, okay, enough. So... Um, then I started and tried my hand at writing, first for stage for myself, and eventually was lucky enough to get into television writing, work myself up to script editor, story editor. I now work across the board in various genres for various channels, um, in soap, sitcom, drama, for Moja Love, SABC, whoever, you know, I'm like a, a gun for hire or a, or a pen for hire. Or fingers for hire. <laughs> yes. So, and then uh, about two years ago, um, I started thinking maybe I should challenge myself and go into a different line again and got involved in animation because it's a hugely growing industry. Um, and in South Africa, it's still relatively small. So it's easy to mm -hmm. almost get a foot in the door, I, th I thought. Huh. Well, famous last words. Anyway, <laughs> I then uh, developed, with the help of the NVF, a, uh, a short film that I managed to produce and make. And I then realized that animation is a total different monster from live action, mm -hmm. um, where live action, you can, you know, it's a process to get money. But once you have money, you can kind of get it going and finish it. Animation takes literally years. Uh, so, it's it's quite challenging, but but very interesting and a fascinating industry, and that's it in a nutshell. Hmm. Steph, sure. I I think I enjoy listening to the two ladies more. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I I grew up in Joburg in in Jubed Park, and by just before we finished high school, I then was also taken for auditions by our drama teacher and it happened to be for crazy. And that's how I started in front of camera as a crazy kids TV presenter on crazy. And which is where I, went, I met Sal that she's mentioned. Um, and as we grew older, I went, I wanted to act more and then I went into acting, did some soapies, did scandal, did some dramas, but I also started feeling like, okay, there's got to be more. Because I also, I mean, at the time, there were a lot of roles that were great, but I'd already, because I started out so young, I'd already played the young girl who dates older men. I'd already played the drug addict girl. I'd already played, you know, the the, the typical sort of um, roles that Black girls um, at that age, at the age I was at, were playing. The alcoholic, you know, the, the one who gets drunk. And, and I wanted a bit more. And I ended up working behind the scenes as my, like my first job behind the scenes was as a, as a head writer and research, a head researcher and writer um, for a show called Spirit Sunday, which allowed me to, the, my boss at the time allowed me to, if I, if I said I want to do this, he'd be like, okay, cool, <laughs> do it. And at the time I didn't know how to do a lot of the things, but the resources were there. So one day I said, I want to direct. And he was like, go there's a cameraman in the office if you want to direct grab him and go tell the story and let's see what you come back with and that led me down this road and it's been fun um i started on spirit sunday i ended up uh, doing a, some tv films as a director and writer and then we did our first film together with uh, as Sorel Media with Salamina, uh, Love and Guaido. And then we did Baby Mamas a few years ago, which has been really fun. And we, yeah, we're in the business of filmmaking. And then I think last year I went into commercials and direct commercials as well. And every now and again, I get the, the honor of being asked to do TV series, which I love. Um, yeah, so this has been my journey in, from TV presenter to writer, director, to sitting with you now, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. That is so nice. I'm just like, 
that's my eyes are ready you know <laughs> and like oh my god oh my god what do i have to say about myself right so it's it's just it's just amazing to just you know be amongst people like you today and thank you so much for like spending time aside in this pandemic when you are at home when you're working from home it's very difficult for you to just you know spare even an hour for work when you're juggling everything so thank you so much for your presence um so a little bit about myself i'm a lady and i'm a producer i've never done acting because <laughs> all the ladies have done acting the only acting i've done is in high school right at the national school of the arts and then after that i went and i pursued film and television at tut in pretoria and then produced a few short films and then on my first feature which i produced which is letters of hope and yeah so i think this industry is not easy but it's great when you you know you see the trailers that we've just seen right uh, the animation the live action and you're just like these people are saying first they are first like director just said she just she opened her animation company and she did her first short animation you're like is it a first wow looks too good to be a first and then and then with 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 you two ladies right selamina and 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 steph we always thought baby mama was the first but actually this love and quite right before that so there's always so much work before you even do what you've done so another thing i wanted to speak to was transition because you guys come from industries you know or rather uh, uh, another industry within the entertainment right so you're from acting and you transition into into business women how is the transition for instance director i know you were in panic mechanic i was like panic mechanic yes <laughs> right see the, the, the blonde eh? the blonde <laughs> right you were in panic mechanic and from that you know to 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 script editor to producing to co-writing Right. and 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 the same goes for you ladies right um salamina you you moved from soul buddies to to being a producer that's that's not easy like honestly from being in front of the screen abom zala we are used to you being an actress the the idea of you being a, a producer is just like ah oh, is it right so just share with us how the transition has been what were the challenges that you guys faced moving from what a, a comfortable platform to something completely new you can go first um salamina oh wow thanks for the pressure i was hoping you were going to say tarata <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's all good you know um i'm sure you've heard that saying you know it takes sometimes a whole lifetime for it to look like you 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 know you just woke up and things just started happening so i think the transition was very gradual and you know for for me as an actress i think you know you you said something you said um you know i i moved from one comfortable place to another i think our industry is uncomfortable mm-hmm. the whole industry yeah um yeah. even for performers for crew it's a really really tough industry and and i know you know i have seen on social media sometimes people are like oh actors are always complaining oh stop complaining and then it's producers are always complaining oh stop complaining then just leave the industry i've always been like it's what i'm really good at i think so i can't go anywhere else okay <laughs> um i've tried to leave the industry i've worked in the corporate sector um but you know when something is for you it, there's just something about having a creative gene even if it's just a little bit um it just calls you you need to create something you 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 are uncomfortable unless you feel like you're putting something into that world whether it's your voice whether it's your story your script your effort arriving on set there's just something about it um and that's why we don't leave um but i think part of why you know you transition from being an actor to trying this and trying that is because you start to either get uncomfortable that you are stagnating um or you start to 
complain too much about other people's products, man. You know, when you are that actress on set, that's always complaining about the producer should do this and the producer should do that. And I wish the director would do this. And oh, oh craft is so ugly. That's where you start to have conversations with yourself and you think maybe, just maybe, I should start my own company so that I um, start to understand what it actually takes to even have a catering company arrive on set, um, to start to understand the process of either looking for uh, products to create or hiring people. And then you start to also have sympathy for all that, you know, the producers that over the years you have moaned about. Um, I think that certainly happened to me. I started to realize that maybe just maybe the producer wasn't out to get me that maybe just maybe the director wasn't being unreasonable, that the wardrobe lady really meant it when she said she has no budget <laughs> and I must bring my own skirt to work. <laughs> you know? um, so I think it was a gradual transition, but it sort of also comes with growth and wanting to challenge yourself and try new things. Um, and then also, you know, if you start to see um, or maybe you don't see enough of something portrayed on TV, you start to want to create that thing that you want to see. You know, I want to see more strong female um, uh, uh, characters that are running boardrooms without being evil, without killing everyone else to get to the top. And then you realize, or okay, maybe I'm not seeing that because other people are creating other characters. Let me add that to the landscape. Um, so uh, the, the, the push for entrepreneurship for me definitely came from the conversations that I was having with Steph. Some of it was born out of frustration. Others, it's just born out of being inspired by other women who came before us or other men we saw do it. And we thought, I would probably be able to do that differently, but I think I can add my, my little two cents worth um, to what we see in this industry. Um, so it was a mixed bag of being frustrated with the systems and then also just wanting to be within the system and then also just growing and then realizing that you want more for yourself and um, not necessarily that this is not enough, but, but that you want to add to it. Um, so, yeah. Steph. Hey, I do it first. Yeah, <laughs> Steph. <laughs> it's just like this. It's it's how the picture is on my screen. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Look, I think <laughs> the uh, Salamina, uh, uh, I think, expressed it really well. It it is a very slow transition, and it is also a calling. The people that you find in our industry really are called to create. Really are called to write or direct or edit or. It is a calling and it is you 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 born with it but you you we end up studying just to enhance the natural talent that we've been born with but i think it's also important to understand that our industry is small so not everybody has the 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 luxury to only do one thing there's very few people who are in our industry and, and only focus on just one job, especially on screen talent. Um, but a lot of us, you when you get in, you, you quickly realize that I won't be able to pay my bills just of one job. I'm gonna need two or three because sometimes that second and the third job come when the first one is no longer there. You know, so you quickly then realize, okay, what other skill do I have that I can that I can put to play so that I can earn an income? So as an actor, you'll act, you'll do voiceovers. And then if you can write, then you start writing. And also if you're not going to auditions or you're going to auditions and it's not the roles that you like, you then do what Dorette does, then you write your own stuff. So you quickly realize that you 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 can't be rigid. In, in the industry or, and in your talent. You have to be very fluid and you, you have to adapt very quickly. Um, and that allows you first and foremost to survive. And it also, it stretches your thinking as a creative, which is also great. Um, mm. and, and, and it grows you. And like Sal said, you end up having sympathy 
towards those who had gone before you that you had worked with in, in the past. So I think it's super important to transition and to be able to, to use all those skill sets. What is unfortunate sometimes is that you end up being forced to use those skill sets. Sometimes you weren't planning on, on accessing or, or using a, a certain skill set because you still wanted to act a bit more. And then the acting jobs dry up because uh, the reality of our industry is it's very small. We don't have enough productions happening at the same time at any given time. It's very small. So there are only so many people who can get jobs at a particular time. Um, and I think we need to, and that's where it gets difficult because we need to find ways to grow our industry. Our industry at the moment sits in the lucrative side, sits in the TV world. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's got shows that have been commissioned by our TV channels. And then it's our films. And then it's theater. Um, and, and then obviously the commercials are also a standalone. But our industry is very small. And, and I feel like if we were able to grow our industry, we'd be able to, to see more talent, but we'd also be able to, to tell more of our stories and be given the opportunity to fail. Because, because our industry is so small, there's no space to fail. There's, when you do a film, when you do a TV show, it has to be a hit or, or it affects the future of those that come after you. So you always have this pressure of if this doesn't work, then and Tabi Singh six months from now will come and pitch and they'll say, no, 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 we've already approved that show and it didn't work for us. So therefore this show is similar. So therefore you can't get the job, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because for, for the industry to go, to grow, there needs to be enough options for all of our audiences. At the moment, we're only creating stuff for a particular group of audience um, and, and, and alienating the rest. So we're only telling a certain type of story uh, because our audience is like this, but our audiences are diverse and they wide. And, and when you give them something new, they, they, they give it a chance. Mm -hmm. But we're at a point where our broadcasters might not always have, you know, again, the luxury to try out new things. They have to stick to what's been tried and tested in the past, which means we, there's only a limited number of, of productions that we can have as a country, which are, but also this, our industry is small, but there's so many people in it. So it's not able to sustain everyone. And that's the reality we also have to face and discuss as people in the industry. So, yeah. So, so um, Stefina, you, you're speaking about a very, very sad reality, right? That about sustaining yourself in the industry and the standards or the bar, right? Of the industry where it is at, at the moment. So, and in your, in your transition from, from, from one space to another, you are forced to know that, you know, when, you, when it's child and tested, that's it. There's no second chances. So in, 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 that, in, in that thought or through that thought, Doretta, what would you say then it takes, you know, to keep your company sustainable? Like, what does it then take you know, you're moving into this new space to say this company is going to, this animation company is going to work. It's going to generate money. And is it generating money? And if it doesn't, what do you do? You know, where do you even get money to, to start? Or do you have to rely on, on commissions? You know, so where, where do you, when you transition your production company, how do you then, you know, um, keep that or, or kickstart it? actually look it is it is extremely difficult um because the industry is small the funds are also very limited and the funds go to a very small pool of people a lot of the time unfortunately 
the uh, the funding also goes to the same pool of people or the the huge productions or the huge commissions so those of us who are on the fringe trying to break in or trying to create a new industry or new platforms um, have to get very creative you know it's 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 very much adapt or fade away um, I think mm. that's why all of us also got involved on the back end of production because we realized um, like Safina said, you you can't you can't um, survive just on one aspect in the industry, and unfortunately, the same is for for production, for for anim whether it's animation or live action, um, it's very hard to get funding outside of the normal channels. We are very fortunate in this country that we do have development funds and we can access money via the Gauteng Film Commission, the NVF, KZN Film Commission, um, but that's also very limited. What it has helped is it has stimulated um, the development of projects that could, we could probably source funding from overseas or on platforms like Netflix, Showmax, uh, because yes, we, we have a very limited uh, amount of platforms that we work on. We work mostly on TV. Our yeah. film industry is very small still. And if we want the South African industry to grow to its potential, we will have to start competing on other platforms. Yeah. Um, Netflix, uh, all of them, the, the online, online platforms, handheld devices, uh, we need to grow the industry in that direction because one, it will probably be a bit cheaper and two, it's more accessible to a wider audience, which might then draw more advertisers and a bit more money in the end, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult. I mean, in the end, you have to kind of, I think, collaborate. So, yeah. ladies, I don't know what you yeah. think of that. It's, uh, yeah, just to jump okay. in, and, and I think... You know, what, what Steph and I learned um, the hard way <laughs> after our first film, feature film, Love and Guaito, was that uh, to not understand what happens in the distribution landscape is actually where um, a lot of us creatives shoot ourselves in the foot. And because South Africa is such a well-developed TV industry, um, the the distribution of our projects was always something that was sort of at the back of your mind. Um, we sort of understood what we have to create um, within the orbit of, I can pitch it to one of the broadcasters. Um, and once we started to see another world out there with more platforms, um, whether online or the VOD streamers that started popping up is, it, it made us then realize that we needed to educate ourselves into the business of the content. Um, what can I do with my creation? Where can I take it? How do I make money? Where do I find money? Um, what can I do with it outside of, you know, the development, which yes, as you rightly put, other countries don't have the kind of funds that we have um, that we can access limited as they are, at least somebody is willing to pay for your concept to have it developed. And, and, and it's great to have partners like that. Um, but we really also need to get ourselves, um, I think those of us who sort of started and have managed to access funds also need to then allow the space as difficult as it is for new entrants into the industry. But that also means that we need to quickly get to having sustainable businesses or at least sustainable projects. I feel like we work project to project <laughs> and it's your project <laughs> yeah. that's busy making money. <laughs> um, mm. You know, so Steph likes to say, we're basically NGOs. I'm like, friend, don't say that. It sounds a bit harsh. Um, but <laughs> it's quite stuck true. In, in... <laughs> it is true. If you get stuck in that funding model, and you rely solely on funds to make your projects, it, it starts to get you in that very difficult place where you can't get out of that system. Um, and, and, and even that is not sustainable, you know. Um, no, it's, it's also an issue for me that we don't have, we never get trained in that bit in the industry True. when you're a youngster. Nobody trains you in how do I sell my project? How do I go to a market? How do I get people to actually talk to me? I mean, when I went to the first animation festival in market, 
I was walking around going, now what, what do I do? How do I do this? And you know, I've been in the industry for years and I was thinking, well, surely someone should have told me or taught me or passed on this information because you're blind. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's really scary space then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we, especially when you come from, from in front of camera, we know in front of camera like we know ourselves, right? Um, when it comes to the rest of the process, I mean, you, you, you've dabbled in it, you've been in it, but you haven't actually done it, which is where we found that there was a lack of uh, complete and full understanding. And so we had to then go on that journey to, to learn. And it, it, it's not a very easy journey, but it's also the climate in which we create under is, also, is first of all, very rough. And then the climate in which our audiences have to consume our, our creations is also very rough. If you're in the film space, it's very different. You don't have a captive audience as opposed to when you're in TV and TV, you just have to worry about the story. Did the people act? Did we capture it? Has it gone to channel? Channel will worry about how many people are watching it. Whereas in, in, in the space we're all in, uh, we still need to worry about how many bums on seats are we gonna get into the movie house, which also adds its own stress to, to creation, because a lot of the time now you're also thinking, um, if I write this line, what sort of people must I expect or do I, do I put in the line or do I not put it in? Which affects our creativity and ends up affecting the output of the story. Because our audience Looks like Steph has frozen there for a second. Salamina, you wanted to, you're muted. I just want to jump in here. So Doretta, I think perhaps just um, understanding some of the people who are tuned in. Oh, friend, you back? <laughs> you had frozen there for a while. Are you uh, back? Sorry, Can you hear I'm me? back. I'm back. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Did you want to carry on with when your point? <laughs> I think um, about creating for the audiences. Oh yeah, no, that was towards, yeah. So you 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 have the pressure of creating for audiences, but you we don't have well enough developed audiences who who, who will commit to coming through to yeah. to your to your film, yeah. um, which is really tough. It's really really tough because it affects numbers. Yeah. So for the new entrance, I think I'm just curious to know, um, Doretta, how, when do you know, when do you know is a good time for you to call in the backup, the cavalry, um, to rescue your business? Um, and where have you found that you had access to a pool of knowledge that might have new entrants into the industry? You know, for me, I wish I could tell you who the cavalry is. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, <laughs> so are we. I was hoping you were gonna <laughs> you had the answers. <laughs> Look, uh, I think you always need a backup plan, and uh, um, in that sense, Steph is probably right. We are more like NGOs a lot of the time. You need a day job too, mm -hmm. which is a terrible thing to say, but that is where our industry is. And um, if we can keep pushing though if we can keep pushing and we can break a few barriers down hopefully those who come after us won't have the same issues uh, if you think about it we we've only recently really got onto the world stage as 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 female producers developers from this country i mean yeah. there were a few before us but on a smaller scale you know it's, yes. it, it was also a lot of television and you've got you have you have a few movie makers that were brilliant in their time but in that generation almost they were there and we were here we we never had access to them or to their methods or how they do it i think the, the world has changed in that sense Very now true. you can ask me dorette what's the cavalry and i can tell you i have no clue please tell me <laughs> if you find them 
<laughs> and maybe they felt the same. We just don't know it, you know. Um, yeah. But you, you have to keep pushing and you have to, marketing is extremely important. And I think getting to festivals is extremely important. Just finding the right festival is also tricky. Also tricky. Because, yeah. uh, a film, we assume everybody would want to see our films, but um, always. <laughs> always, because it's quite precious to you. But it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> but we have a very specific way of telling stories in this country, and um, it doesn't always yeah. appeal to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. That's very true. Now, lady. Ready? Hi, ladies. I'm back. Hey. <laughs> we were holding for you. I saw Sal. I was like, the reason why I love the transition about these women, I knew they'll hold it down. <laughs> I knew the whole was about to go way. into a, a king is soliloquy. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. We're taking notes. Yeah, we're taking notes. <laughs> I hear, I hear you speaking, you speaking, I, I wanted, I actually, while, while you're on what, on your topic, uh, uh, Sal, I wanted us to speak about your, your productions, right? That now you're saying the world now, you know, is waiting for content. You, you and, 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 and Stefina, your film is now on Netflix. A huge congratulations, right, ladies? That is huge. That is big. And for a female production company, with a female narrative, right? Which is very yeah. impressive, which we, we hardly have. And to be on such a big platform, how, how is it? How did you guys get, get to that? Because just breaking into television already, our SABCs, you know, it's quite difficult, but you guys have now went on a world-class stage and that already is just a plus. It just means great things are about to happen. You know, it's just going to get bigger and better. So yeah. how was that? And how how did you guys get to it? How did you guys get your film there? Yeah. So um, I think as producers, it's a fantastic thing for us to be on Netflix. It's, it, it, it was the dream. Once we were out of cinema, uh, we were like, okay, now what? Um, so you, there's what filmmakers term... Um, the windows. So there's different windows that a project goes through. So first window is that theatrical release where we're in cinema. And then the next window must kick in as soon as you leave. So from cinema, we then went to the DSTV box office. Um, uh, we also did like a side release in Nigeria, which was a great learning tool for us we can come back to that later and um, because their industry is completely different and oh how mind-boggling it was for us to be in uh, that that nollywood world um and then after you know we did that we came to dstv box office then we did a tv window and then all the time though from when we left cinema so this is like about a year that I'm talking about. It's a couple of months how you roll out the windows. We had always been dreaming, Netflix, 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 Netflix. Um, so when it happened, it was fantastic for us. Um, um, but, you know, it doesn't stop there because then you're like, great, that's, you know, just another platform. What more is out there? What can we get from this? How do we massage this so that it helps us um, with future projects, you know, so you always need to think of 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 uh, your 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 not just the the single project that you're working with, but what happens immediately after. What can you do that is sustainable? Because sustainability is the key. Um, we need to be building film businesses, um, just like they are well-established production houses. They need to be well-established film production houses. And that's really where our love of, of this industry comes from. You know, Steph and I, when we started our business, we were like, great, so we've been on the big productions. We've worked for the Ocas, we've worked for the big production houses, the Ender Malls, et cetera. And we saw what they did and they graded it. We were wanting to be 
a small company that is going to come and do something different. So we actually started on the online space and had a channel called Aza TV. And we created various short format programs because all we were thinking is we have to retain our intellectual property. So mm. being on Netflix now, it's almost like we've come full circle and we still own this baby. And now we can say, oh, as producers, a product that we created start to finish is now on a big platform like that. And we can get into the room to have discussions with the powers that be about what happens after this. Um, and that's really the model that I feel needs to be developed um, at a faster pace, um, but put more, uh, you know, as, as a country, more effort needs to be put into making sure that creatives are able to hold on to their babies and have that baby grow mm. and, and be involved at all stages. Um, because then that's how, as a filmmaker, you start to know the business end of what it is that we're doing. That's how we change our industry. Um, as a producer, if I am unable to employ more people, I can't have the kind of impact in the industry um, that is going to actually make a difference for future generations. Um, like mm -hmm. Dorette said earlier, you know, there were women who came before us, but we didn't necessarily have access to them in a way that they were able to pass the baton. Mm -hmm. Now we have to, as the filmmakers in this space, hold mm -hmm. the ground um, mm -hmm. and pass the baton onto the new up and coming. I liked you said you went to National School of the Arts. You know, it's great for me to be speaking to somebody who came from an art school and then stayed in the industry because many others left. Because once you start to realize that, ah, there's no money here, you sort of like, ah, my mom was right. I should have studied <laughs> law or accounting. <laughs> and mm, God, mm, of course, mm, definitely. Companies. Yeah, you know, so we need to have a lot more sustainable businesses in this industry that are then going to push this industry and have it become a powerhouse like a Nollywood, like a Bollywood, like a Hollywood. You know, um, we can all argue about what ours is going to be called, Sollywood, Egolywood, whatever. Um, but it needs to <laughs> um, because certainly the talent is there for it to happen, but it's going to take a seismic shift of different creatives surviving in this industry and then thriving in this industry for it to start to be called a proper industry. I think you touched on, on a very important thing, the IP. You, you know, for years and years and years, creatives in our industry, we, we just, you create stuff, you pass it on, it goes. Mm -hmm. And that means you have nothing to build on. It's a building block. So mm -hmm. the minute you can hold on to the IP, it's like a business card. And next time I can hand that in and say, okay, this is what I've done. Now help me to do the next thing and the next thing. So that is why Netflix and them are really potentially game changers for us because suddenly we can go in on an equal footing and say, I'm not giving up my IP, um, which we've been doing and have, we've had no choice in the matter. I like that. We've had no choice. Um, and I think it's it's very important that we, I like being realistic. I'm a, I'm a realistic person. So what Dorette and Salah are saying is we can talk about industry and we can talk about survival and we can talk about all these things, but until we have a, a, a realistic, truthful conversation around IP, we're not going anywhere because we, we're just pouring into an into an empty well. Like there's, we need to have our creatives own, even if I always say, even if it's a portion of their work, but they need to own a portion or all of their work where possible. But unfortunately, we've been operating in a system that, I mean. TV only came in 1976 or 75 in South Africa and came with its own rules and nobody questioned those rules. And into, when we got into the new dispensation, nobody said, wait, hold on, we need to relook the mm. T's and C's. Into 94, nobody 
said, let's look at our Copyright Act where, where TV and film is, is concerned. So we still have producers coming up with amazing pieces of work, but they don't own it. Our broadcasters owned it, but they didn't come up with it. So and our broadcasters don't particularly travel with it or do much with it. They don't build they don't do on it. it. They just, they just, they own just it for the consume. Yeah, consume. Yeah. You know, which we, we can't. So therefore, there's no building block. The block gets taken away every time. So every time you're starting from scratch, every single time you are starting as if you've never produced anything in your life. So until we have those conversations, I don't know if it's worth having any other conversation because as a country, our creatives are, are being bled dry. Or changed a lot. Yeah. But, and and on, on, on the topic of, of, of owning IP, right? So you have a form and you don't know what to do with it, right? And you take it to amazing film festivals. That's, that's, I think that's the one thing that the filmmaker on their own, they can do, right? So you take your film to, to, to diff to our, um, our Joburg Film Festival, right? To, to, to our Toronto's. So your film gets to travel globally. Right, and I think your animation as well did the same, the, the same director, and it's still traveling even even in twenty twenty, right? So your film, your film as a as a film as a filmmaker gets to travel so much, and then it, the festival run is done. You know, reality strikes. You now need to actually make money from this because festivals, you know, it's it's showcase, right? It's, it's not it's not a money making. It's about network. So you come back, you have your film, it's sitting here. And the first thing you have to do is what? Call a distributor to take your film somewhere. So when, 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 when Stefina, you're speaking about actually having an, an honest talk, right? On our films and where they're going, how do we, how do we access, you know, um, the television space without a distributor? How do we, how do you, how do you even get a distributor? You know, I know with Letters of Hope, it was a real struggle, to be honestly, honest, honest. It, it was a real struggle to just get a distributor from the get-go. No, and then we did Div, and then you come back with artistic bravery, and then people reply to your emails, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> For the mm -hmm. first time. And you're like, oh, so that was... <laughs> emails so you sent it didn't happen them. like that. If it didn't happen like that, then where would I be, right? Yeah. So now you, now you have a, a pool of distributors that you've contacted, all of them. Now it's a choice. Who do I go with? You know, mm -hmm. whose commission is not as much. Mm -hmm. And how much, how long is now, now they go in and negotiate for you. They negotiate and then, you know, broadcast owns, they own your film for like a good 10 years. Or 20, let's just, be specific, 20. 20, you see. No, some of them say 10. They could end it for 10 if we really negotiate well, you know. And mm -hmm. when we're realistic, they take it for 20. And you are paid off. You are not once, right? Once they've done their payment and they can play it over and over and over and over and over. And we are not making any, 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 any money from it. Yeah. And this is something that has always been happening. Yeah. So as, as young filmmakers, you know, moving director in the, in the animation space, you are, you are quite young because you say you just opened your company. As young filmmakers, how do you have full control of your IP? Let's just talk about, let's just be honest. Is it even, even, even a thing? Is it even possible? Right? It's, 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 it, it sounds like a dream. The impossible dream. <laughs> yes, it, it is kind of the impossible dream in many senses, but you know, you have to start somewhere. And um, I'd look in animation. If you, I think with most things, if you can make a short movie or you make a movie, look, if you make a movie, it's a lot of money. A short film is, is less expensive in any any format um and then if you can get to festivals and stuff the idea is to to try and build collaborations we have great treaties with many countries um with canada with france and they're actually looking to invest and they're looking to partner with people here in the country but they don't want to partner with someone who hasn't done anything 
So Oops. that is why they most of the time go to people who are actually um, either experienced or have big production houses. They don't always pick the first timers. But if you can use your form in some way that they at least talk to you and you can, they can see you're busy developing your second one, your first one is out there, this one won a few awards, you can again, it's back to building blocks, you can build a relationship and hopefully get them on board. And um, the minute you have somebody outside come in and help you, the negotiation process changes. Yes, you give up some of your IP to them, but at least locally, they won't just go, I want the whole thing and you don't get anything and bye bye, you have more grounds to negotiate. So it's mm. a it's a long process it's a tedious process. And it's not perfect. Uh, in by any standard, um, but at least we're there now, at least we have the treaties, we have the options. Um, so I, I suppose we just have to keep chiseling at it and, uh, and try and get people in the, in the film commissions to, to be the voices for us filmmakers and, and be the go-between, between the rule makers and us, because we are cut off from the rule makers. We, we can't get. Yeah, I think it's really important to, um, you know, explain to people exactly how important film festivals and markets are. Mm -hmm. um, because I think until we started attending those, we ourselves didn't quite understand the whole pie. We understood a portion of it, but a very important part of it is what happens to your product, who's selling it, how are they selling it, how much can you make from it? And that is extremely important um you know so going to festivals and going to markets i can't I, I can't stress it enough it's it's extremely important especially if you are the person who has that ip it's also um you know it's 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 counterproductive to 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 want to hold on to a hundred percent of a tiny minuscule little thing um when giving up 10% could potentially open other avenues for you. So sometimes we obsess about the ownership um, without understanding that if we think of it as a business, to get an investor interested in your business, sometimes you have to give up. In fact, most of the time, otherwise the investor is your uncle, your dad, <laughs> as somebody who's just trying to develop you <laughs> for the Christmas. <laughs> Um, you know, a real investor is going to take um, a portion of, of, of that because they want returns on that investment. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, but, but of course, ask questions, do the research. Um, we have film bodies, we have commissions, you know, the GFC people were a great tool for us when we did Love and Guaito because we didn't know a lot about what happens after I've shot. Um, and, mm. you know, they were a great um, partner for us with marketing. Um, and actually, you know, they, they, they um, assisted us, um, you know, even with attending festivals for baby mamas. Um, mm. it's, it's just, you have to get out there. You have to network. You have to collaborate. You have to have conversations, even uncomfortable ones. Um, Steph and I, you know, we, we do like a... a good cop, bad cop type of little act. Um, you know, Doretta likes to say she used to play the blonde all the time. We as actors, we still do that. Um, when we're asking questions, you under, you know, you you disarm people by just being honest about how little you know. Um, and and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. You know, so we'll ask these questions. You heard earlier on stuff is like, can I ask a stupid question? We do that a lot. <laughs> Okay. There's nothing wrong with it because yeah. people can give you, you know, the, the correct answers if you just put yourselves out there. Um, for us to get to where we need to get, um, I, I think we also need to stop comparing ourselves to the very well-developed Hollywood. Um, you know, that's a whole industry where even the contracts are, are at a certain standard, where there's laws in place. Um, a, a script writer knows that having a conversation with a producer, um, uh, you don't have to be scared that they're going to steal your, your, your concept and your IP because you have one, two, three protections. You've already registered it there. You've trademarked this and you did it. So there's a whole uh, uh, um, ecosystem 
that supports uh, the creative sector. We're still very much at that place where we're still having conversations about protecting uh, the, the, the assets that we have and our businesses. Uh, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I agree that there's a lot of work that still has to be done, right? There's so much work that, um, and, and you said you said we need to get ourselves out there, uh, like markets, home festivals, right? So for instance, there's, I think a lot of festivals or, you know, people go to festivals and it's like, but I can watch this movie afterwards, right? I, I don't have to go watch it at the festival because it's opening this festival, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. But what is it about the markets that you guys can share from your experiences, your Discops, your, your Diff Mart? What has, what has those um, platforms done for you as filmmakers for your content? Um, you know, Doretta and, 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 and Stefina, what has that actually done for your films? You know, what connections have you guys made or network you've built to say, to say definitely, you know, Discop is worth going to, for example? Dorit, you can go. <laughs> uh, you know, it's 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 a networking exercise. It's the best way I can describe it. I don't know if you have a different word for it, Stefina, but you 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 meet people that you can collaborate with, people that um, you can talk to about future projects. So it's not always just about the project you have right there at that moment. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. mostly about relationships and about building building collaborations. Nobody works with anybody. Nobody gives anybody money that they don't know. If you think about it, you only, you, you know, you think twice before you give fam your family money. How is, how can you expect a stranger? You have never, no, but really it's true. Now you go to a stranger who's never met you. You say, hi, I'm a brilliant movie maker. Can you give me money? Yeah. It's the same thing. Um, so it's a lot about building relationships, about getting to know them, about using your charm, like something I said, playing the dumb blonde if you have to, but um, getting their attention <laughs> and uh, trying to, to uh, again, just, just see where the industry is going, where there's gaps, uh, what different channels need, what different countries are interested in. It's fascinating mm -hmm. when you speak to people from France and people from China and people from other industries and you realize that we have so much to offer them. We sometimes just slant it wrong or we, or we pitch the wrong thing to the wrong country or we, so, so it's a learning curve, a network, networking thing. Um, yeah, I, I think Dirt, you're very correct. Um, I'll tell you, Naledi, what our first Discop, when we went to Discop for the very first time a few years ago, we came back and we were like, what? There's a whole world out there of people <laughs> just like us and people who deal with the stuff we're trying to do and trying to make. So we came back to the office that day and we were like, because I mean, especially if you're very new in the industry and you're a small player like we are, it's very easy to get discouraged. It's very easy to doubt yourself and just go, you know what, I love this idea, but it's never going to happen. So let me just leave it. I can tell you at Discom, at Discop, we met, um, this is one guy we met uh, from Nigeria. And he had, he was there looking, he's a distributor, but he was looking for international distribution for the stuff that he owned as a distributor. And he was, the way he was talking about film and how he can sell it to South Africa and how it must he's looking for someone from China to buy some of his films and some of his series we were like wait hold on there's a whole other world to this and he wasn't he was very accessible as compared to to how our distributors work in South Africa our distributors they almost gatekeepers to a certain extent actually not to a certain extent they are they gatekeepers. are they are gatekeepers. So it was very refreshing to speak to somebody who understood that my job is to get content and to sell it on. Um, so I will meet whoever I need to meet who's going to buy it and I know how to sell it. And this is, he believed in his content. And after meeting with him, we got back to our office and we were like, 
I think it was before we had made Love and Guaito. We met him the November. That January, we were shooting Love and Guaito. Because we it, something clicked in our brains that don't overthink it. Because especially when you have two personalities, and then mostly women are like that. We perfectionists. We want everything to have lined up before we mm-hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. If you don't have it lined up, you're not going to make the move yet. Whereas guys just make the move. Guys walk into a room and tell you, I want to make it. And you're like, what have you directed? No, I haven't directed anything, but I'm a director. But I, I can't. Yeah. Yeah, I know mm-hmm. I can do it. Woman mm-hmm. will first start as a as a the production assistant to work their way up. Meanwhile, this person can direct, but they're just like, no, I'm not ready. I haven't been in the mm-hmm. industry. I, I just want to learn everything. <laughs> <laughs> and meeting that guy I was like he believes in his content and whether or not I think his content is good is not the issue the issue is I've already ruled myself out of my content being worthy of being seen and sold to other territories and we had to fix that about ourselves and go we've never shot a feature film before as mm. a company we don't know how but we'll never find out until we start, until we pick up a call and go, we're looking for a DOP, until the, d- the first day of, of shooting and we're like, okay, cool, we are at the location, what else do we need? So yeah. it was, Love and Quieto was, was our learning curve, our big learning curve, that had, had Love and Quieto not happened, I guarantee you baby mamas would never baby have happened. Have. Yeah, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. never have. Yeah, so just to it, add to that, sorry, Steph, I just, you reminded me of something. We actually submitted Love and Guaido for TIFF. We became those people because yeah. of the very guy that Steph is talking about. And though we didn't get into TIFF, we got a letter from TIFF that said, great film, nice potential, would love to meet you guys. You sound like a fantastic team. Try get yourselves to TIFF. Unfortunately, we can't fund it. And mm. that Mm. completely changed how we viewed ourselves and um, how we thought of everything that we create going forward. Awesome. So what I, I wonder if, if in the in our industry in South Africa, well, but, well, maybe it's a South African thing, I don't know, but we are, as women, we tend to be very apologetic. Mm-hmm. We uh-huh. apologize. We apologize for the fact that I'm talented. I apologize that... I have an idea. I apologize that I want to be a movie maker. I apologize that I, I don't want to act anymore. I apologize for, we apologize. Yeah. And um, the industry to me, the international industry also, that was one of the things I, I learned from them is they are unapologetic about Completely. sometimes the biggest load of nonsense. Yes. A guy or a girl will <laughs> sell you, they'll tell you a story and you look at them, you go, you've got to be kidding me. That is yes. the biggest load of I've never heard anything so bad, but they sell it to you and they believe in it and they believe in themselves. Yeah. And, and that's another hurdle we need to get over in this country. We, we need to believe we are talented, that we can compete, that we, that we have the skill set. We don't always. We but, uh, but Doretta, on, on that point, Doretta, saying that we are very apologetic, especially us as Phoebians, right? What do you think causes it? Is it is it a matter of so 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 for instance, um, Steph, you just said you know I'm not ready yet to direct, uh, you know, and that's that's something that I've said. Right, I, I think I'm a better producer than a director. Oh my god, I don't think I'll I'll be you know, and that's why we have very few female directors. So, no, no, no. but why is it not the reason? Not the reason? Because we are apologetic. We don't want to. We are scared. To do it, we are scared to take. It's the truth. one of the reasons. We're, we're one of the do. reasons. It's one of the reasons. We're we're very scared to do it, right? But sometimes you get to a point where you're like, ah, I'm doing it anyway. But then the next hurdle comes into. We 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 are we're living in a society where they'll question you as a as a girl, but they're not going to question a guy. So the guy, you, exactly. That's so exactly. How where many I'm going films with have you done? But yeah. a guy will come in and be like, "Yeah, I haven't directed. I haven't directed a film, but I believe I can do it." 
and, then and he should... gets the opportunity to do it. So is is it is it the sexism now? Let's speak to the sexism that that we face on, on a daily, and as as female as female practitioners, is that we are faced, we are in a in a, an environment or we are in a space where males dominate, right? And then we are scared to take chances because male dominate. Is it is how how has that affected? us as females moving forward or have and and another thing that has been huge right and i heard this story the other day where this girl was sharing with me that you know the lady there's this director and i'm a lecturer by day and full makeup at night right so the student says oh lady i've been on the set it was so great being on the set and i think i'm ready for my first short and i'm like yeah you should apply you know the nbf is opening soon blah 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 and i'm encouraging her and then i ask so have you have you started putting your application together you know because it's gonna open soon she says yeah and lady but my mentor you know i was very uncomfortable with my mentor and i'm like what are you talking about this is my mate i'm like what mentor right my male mentor on his set and I don't think I want to continue with this anymore. And I'm like, excuse me, that shouldn't stop you, right? So there are so many things apart from just uh, getting the sexism treatment, but there's also those elements of sexual harassment that I think we need to get over, right? Or we need to move past and we need to address on a daily, right? As females, so that we are more comfortable on set. So, so how... You know, I, I just want us to say, what is your take on issues of sexual harassment in, in our space, right? And, and sexism within our space. And how do, we, how do we then grow when the environment seems so toxic? I'll, I'll speak to the sexism for now yes. and, and say, I think one of the biggest blessings I have had was to go to a girls' school that had a very strong principal who was a woman, but she was very strong-minded and she instilled a lot of how she thought in us. Sal knows this. Whenever she meets some of the girls I went to high school with, she'll always go, sure. But now go rent girls. Sure, link <laughs> And it's because our, our, we were told in school, we, we were allowed to be. You know, we were allowed to, if you wanted to, to act and, and you've written something, our principal would say, okay, cool, Friday assembly, do it. If you wanted, if you disagreed with something that she said or, or you know, had applied in, in the school, you'd set up a meeting and go state your case and she'd listen to you. And I grew, I mean, I was a teenager then where I was allowed to express myself. I remember the one day she put me in a class, in a new class every year. And I didn't, I was like, I, I'm not comfortable with this teacher. She doesn't like us, da, 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 da. And she mm, was like, mm, mm, mm. she listened. She listened. She didn't change me, but she, she didn't change me and move me to another class, but she listened. And sometimes that's all you need for your confidence to grow to be, so that you understand that what you have to say matters. So fast forward years later, I'm working in this industry and as a black woman, in an industry full of, it's in Joburg, a lot of black men who come from, from, we all come from different homes and we've all been taught different things. But one of the main things that they've all been taught is whether they admit it or not, is a woman is beneath me. A woman has their place and a woman can only talk to me like this and not hey. like that. Hmm. So now you walk on set and you a black woman and you the boss, you're the director of this whole ship. And you're not good, you, you know, it's, I had to learn very quickly that you get judged very quickly as a woman when you are stern and you are strict and you know exactly what you want and you're able to articulate. You get called certain names. Because they still expect you to get there and go, oh, Papa, wait till you go by this shot. Wait till... I, I think an MCU would be great for this shot. <laughs> Can you please it to me? So they want, they still, there's some men who still want to be approached with that, with that, you know, you need to be humble. You need to beg them. Oh, Papa. 
And then here comes this girl who get there and go, uh, I need an MCU. And then, and then it'll be, no, no, no. I, I think I've already set up for a close up. So then I had to learn to go, oh, that's great. Thank you. But I need an MCU. And then you start, you get the guy who gets shocked that, oh, wait, is my power being, uh, is my authority being questioned here? And it's like, no, I'm not questioning your authority, Baba. I am asking you to do something because it is my job to ask you to do things in this mm. vicinity here. I am not your cousin. I am not your little sister. I am not your mm-hmm. mother. I am not your aunt. I'm Stephanie. And it ends there. And once you start on that journey, you, 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 I, I, I mean, thank God I'm an actress as well, because a lot of the time it, I have to pull from being an actor either mm. to stop myself from swearing at them mm. or <laughs> to just, you know, learn to, to, to be level-headed and, and not take certain things personally, but call you out on it with a straight face. Yeah. So there's a lot of things we navigate when we get on to set. And a lot of it has to do with being questioned. A lot of guys will question you when you say, I need this. Because they believe, no, but I've already done it this way and this way is the right way. Without always understanding that, yeah, even if you've done it this way, right now, the director wants it this way and it is your job to give it in the way the director has asked. And it's not to say we're not here to collaborate and to get, you know, to share ideas, not that at all, but it is at this moment, this is what they've asked for. Unless your reason you know, surpasses all and, and it's a much better idea. But you can also already tell when, it, when somebody is coming to the table with a great idea and when somebody is just refusing to listen to your idea only because they think you're beneath them, they think you're not a good enough director, you basically a woman. And so you, you, you have to, you, I've had to learn to, to try and smoothen out some, some, some of the spaces I work in. I've also had to learn to fire people hmm. because sometimes I just can't work in that space. I can't work with a person who constantly uh, is on a journey to not only undermine me, but to leave me and my ego and my, and my confidence completely washed out. So I have to fire you. I have to let go. I have to remove you from my space. We are in a creative space. We, we all need positive energies. If I feel, Mm-mm, this is not going to work. I share it with the people I need to share it with. It's my producers to go, uh, yeah, no, that's just not, that person is not going to work. And it's not because they're not good. It's because they can't, they don't always realize that they are unable to work with me as a director. And I can, I feel things like when I walk on set, I already, in five minutes, I know whether something is right or something is wrong. So when I walk in and I feel like, "Mm -mm, tonality vibes more, I have to get to the source of it. And if the source of it is this, then we have to solve it. Usually I'll talk to you face to face and go, do you have a problem with me? Do you have a problem with taking my instructions? What is the issue really? And, and iron it out. And sometimes it only takes that. Sometimes it only takes a conversation before a person, because you have to check a person because they don't, because it's so ingrained in our society and in our brains, only when you call, call them out on it, do they go, yeah, actually, sorry. You know, because they couldn't do yeah. that. I was and to me, to me, it's, it's, it's even worse that, look, I understand that the male thing is an issue and we've all had to deal with it and we all deal with it all the time. What to me is very sad is that sometimes you actually get it from women, that it's mm. like women shut you down because women don't like women getting ahead, which to me is even worse. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. Uh, it, that's... Uh, yeah no excuse for that really it's a very valid point that you raise i think we i mean sal and i are two are two women so we used to to working with women and 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 um being in a space with with women and not just as other women and a lot of the time when we we in production there's a lot more women so we, we where we where we do experience that we also try and call it out 
but we try and cultivate an environment where as much as possible, the woman can thrive in that environment. I mean, you, we don't all have to be friends. It's, it's, it's amazing that Sal and I can be friends, but we don't all have to be friends. We're here to work, right? But in us working at the end of this project, we all need to have grown because such is the life of a creative. When I, five years ago as a director, I was one kind you know, I was a director in this way. And, and five years later as a director, I direct very differently to how I directed Love and Guaito. So we need to all be able to track our growth. There needs to be a difference at the end of, of the production that in your next project, you'll be able to apply some of the lessons you, you learned in your, in your previous project. Hmm. All right, and and as as so we so speaking to sexism and and inequality, right, towards towards women and having to be firm and maybe other women bringing us down, right? How do you, as women, we've come a long way, like we've we've dealt with it or we've just bottled it in for so long, right? Yet there's women rights have have been there, like we have rights. We know we can speak out, but we choose not to. Hence, now there's organizations like SWIFT, right, in place for us to, to, to utilize them. But why are we not utilizing these systems? You know, why, why are these issues, you know? It, it, so, so, Doretta, you've been long in the industry. Has it always been a problem, you know, that females are very, very submissive and very scared and very timid that we do not speak out. And does that actually affect the type of content that we create, right? Because for instance, in, 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 my, in, in our production company, Trial by Media, you know, the other day I was, I, I was, I was pitching this idea to my co-founder and I'm like, I think this is it, right? I think this is the next female story that we should tell. And because he, he's a male, it's, yeah, but we've had other stories, Naledi, that are better, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's just normal for him to act like that, I suppose, right? But, and then the, the normal me would be like, yeah, I, it's fine. But for the moment, I thought, why? Why should I say it's fine? I said, oh, no, it's fine. When we're done with your film, you're doing mine, right? It, it's, it's about that time. So why don't we, why don't we have that? Has it always, is it a generational thing that needs to change? You know, is it how we see ourselves? Because inequality is there. We cannot act as if it's not. So when you produce as a female, for instance, on Letters of Hope, people wouldn't respond to my emails, you know, as fast as they would to, 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 to for the Africa's emails. And I'm like, mm. and in the boardroom, other people will expect him to speak and not, you know, like, you know, when you're looking for money. And it's just weird. I'm like, what's going on here? And why have you been why told that it be like that? bring your boss? Sal and I yeah, have been in the boardroom yeah, and we were asked, Where's your boss? <laughs> they say, oh, um, lung, when? Yeah, where's the boss? And then we both do like a thing, and then Steph will go, Oh, th there's the boss. And then I point yeah, to boss. her, Oh, there's the boss. <laughs> and then they get so uncomfortable. <laughs> like, no, no, we don't mean, no, you do mean that. You do mean, exactly. Don't say you don't mean, you do mean. So, yeah. so we are in, we are in, a, in an environment where now, Changes still need to happen within our industry for females, right? A lot of changes. And so, because now there's so many questions now in, in, our, in, our, in our inbox, guys, that already. I want us to get to. Yes, already. So, to jump in here. So, um, the, the, the patriarchy and gender inequality is not unique to South Africa. The, this is a fight that we're seeing happening internationally. Uh, you go to Davos, there's a thousand men and four women. You know, you go to almost throughout the world in every different sector. So it isn't a unique to the arts um, and it isn't unique to South Africa. Um, but the important thing that we as women need to remind ourselves and remind each other is we need to hold spaces for each other and we need to um, get more women into these important conversations, into the room, into our boardrooms, into our production houses, into positions that matter, because that is the key. Um, you know, I, until 
um, I had seen Steph operate on a set as a woman. I didn't, I had seen it, but it wasn't personal, you know, until I, you are the producer supporting the director. You know, it mm. took me being on set to see how other people listen to her instructions versus what I've seen as an actor happen when, um, you know, like the first man that directed me, Bobby Heaney, you know, I saw how he commands a set and the respect that he got. And then I saw uh, Steph in exactly the same position, sometimes on a bigger production than what I had ever been on. And now the difference was it was our set and she had to run it. And people were struggling to take that mm. lead and those instructions. And they were second guessing her and questioning. And I think that is the power of us as producers, as female producers. There's things that we are able to see. There's a unique context we come with. There's a unique eye that we have. And there are experiences that we have had that inform the kind of culture that we create on our set. And my set will never be a set where women feel like they are harassed or feel like they need to have extra protection, et cetera. And that's just because my unique position um, allows for me to create and have conversations with the people that we hire as the boss, because I am in a position to actually make a difference. I am no longer just the person who's coming in and out. I am literally hiring. And you know the problematic personalities. I can call them out on it. You know, so mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of the swift type of uh, organizations, but also just in our own spaces, in our companies, letting people know that we will not apologize, we will not allow, we will not accept, um, you know, to be treated as second class citizens, etc., and other people. So it's protecting the intern that comes because there are positions on a set that do leave you vulnerable to being exploited. Um, and, and, you know, it happens a lot to young women. Um, it also can happen to just young people who are coming into the industry who are being abused. So it's, 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 it's about creating the kind of spaces and environments that we want people to be happy to come to work for, you know? So this is not a conversation I'm, that can be covered in such a short session. It's, it's a small space of time. Layered, yeah, I agree. But how do we get there? Is it, is it how, as creatives, we respond, maybe, right, to gender-based violence? Is it the ideology, right? How do we, how do we, you know, stories are very powerful too, right? And, and story empowers. So is it, is, is it in, in the name of us as creatives now, telling more stories that are about females, you know, addressing gender-based violence, a response to that, right? So, for instance, your film is Baby Mamas is is a female driven narrative, right? And it's empowering and it's showing different sides of females. And so is it those types of stories that actually can gear us up? How do we as creatives, right? We need to respond now as females, knowing what's happening within our country, gender-based violence. How do we as creatives respond ideology in terms of how we see our films, how, where we're going with our films as, as, as female filmmakers, uh, you know, as directors, as producers, the kind of content that we are about to create. So is, 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 is the, is the ide what's the ideology and the work that it takes for us to empower ourselves as filmmakers, to have a voice and to empower those watching? Yeah. We are essentially attacking cultural norms here. You know, so the impact that we will have is very different because different uh, things appeal to different people. But as you rightly put it, you know, Steph always fights um, for her female characters. When she writes a story, she wants the female to be in a position of power. And that's really important because we make these stories for people that, that are watching. And of course, every time we put out a piece of work, it creates a perception. It has a life beyond which, uh, you know, it comes off the pages and these people are portrayed, these characters become portrayed by real people. And we add to this kitty of the conversations that we are having about the role of women. So they'll never 
uh, you know, so gender e equality can, of course, be tackled in our stories and will continue to be so. But it does also take us fighting for the right to tell those stories. We had people who were saying, yeah, yeah but, you know, make the men more powerful. No, Whoa, different story. In this story, the women are powerful. Mm. And what are the tips that we can give to, 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 to females coming into our industry, Doretta and, and Steph? What are the tips to say, as a female, this is how you arm yourself into this industry? You know, this is, these are the tips. This is what you should stand by, or these are the values. But what can we give, the advice we can give to, to, to females out there coming into this industry? Nothing comes easy. It's, it's very important to remember that. Um, if you've listened to the journeys we've all been on, training is essential, any form of training that you can find. I know not everybody has access and sometimes you have issues with funds, but a lot of the platforms these days have master classes or classes that they host for free that you can join. There are colleges who, who run stuff that you can join if you really have a fund issue. So try and get some training in whatever you're interested in, um, gain some experience. If you can do an internship, go and make tea somewhere if you have to uh, you have to go through the steps and then mm. stop apologizing for for your dream for what you want to do if you think you have a story and you're a brilliant potential movie maker get out there and, and try and empower yourself nobody's going to do it for you unfortunately we're in a in an industry in a country where if you don't do it yourself it's not going to happen <laughs> you have to you yep. have to get online go to the different commissions um apply for funding you know you you have to do the footwork you have to you have to do what men do men have been breaking down doors they walk in, like Steph said, they walk in and go, I can do this. I'm doing this. I'm doing it now. And everybody goes, okay, we have to become that. It's the only way we will change the industry as it is. Yeah. And I think also, uh, Naledi, just to, to, to uh, touch on your, on your question about gender equality and gender-based uh, violence that that women experience and and the storytellers how how do we how do we tell that story how do we raise awareness I, I think Sal touched on you know and you also touched on baby mamas being being led by four women I think what's important with the storytellers going forward uh, whether it's producers directors writers the 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 entire ecosystem is when I when when I write, I I'm not writing a female led story. I'm writing a story, mm -hmm. and because it comes from my perspective as a woman, mm -hmm. it'll mean I will portray women in the way I understand them and in the way I would I've seen them be in in real life. So we the more you hire. Uh, women storytellers will be the more you get that perspective so we up until a few years ago most 98 uh, percent of the of the films we, we were getting and making well so getting from internationally and making locally were stories led by male characters or stories told from a male perspective so the more we hire women will be the more our female perspective in all its glory and in all its diversity will then be released into, into our audiences. Um, so there's no one way of doing it, but I think we just need to be allowed into certain spaces that we haven't been allowed into for centuries. And when we're there, we need to fight for the, the story you want to tell because it's very easy for people to question your perspective. No, but women don't do that. Like, but are you a woman? <laughs> are you this woman? Mm -hmm. You know, so we need to, I think we need to be truthful to that, to, to, the, to the varying different voices and, and appreciate each voice. It, it, all of them will be different because women are different. And men have been allowed for all these centuries to tell however many stories they like. Let's also be to, uh, be allowed to do the same. And if the story has been told, tell it again if this if it's the story you want to tell. So yeah. Mm. 
Any other tips for, for newcomers? Because I see I we've lost the lady again. Yeah. It, most important is, you know, there are barriers to entry. There are barriers to entry in any industry. Um, but, you know, I think definitely my phrase of the day has to be stop apologizing. I love that. Thank you, Dorit. I'm going to quote you everywhere I go now because it's true, you know. Um, so it's really important for people coming into the industry. Stop apologizing. Yes, you're young. Great. Yes, you're a female. Great. Yes, you're young. You're black. You, you know, you're inexperienced. That is All not experienced at some point. At some point, even the greatest and, and, and most famous filmmakers in the world, um, producers, entrepreneurs, etc., were once inexperienced. So the most important thing is, you know, learn the lay of the land, get in there, get your, get your hands dirty, um, investigate, explore, um, don't give up, don't allow. I think we do this as a lot, um, a lot as women is we allow the naysayers to have a bigger impact uh, on our journey than those who are like, try it, go ahead. You know, you, we're scared of being criticized um, especially in, 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 in this um, world of online, you know, one bad review can go viral <laughs> and it can potentially completely destroy you, your, your self-esteem, your self-confidence. Um, but it's also, it's just reminding ourselves that this is at the end of the day, a subjective medium. Um, I think whenever I remind myself, you know, that my project is not for everyone. Not everyone is going to think it's brilliant. And that's okay. They are products from, you know, uh, well-known producers and directors that I have personally not liked. And it doesn't stop Quentin Tarantino from making another movie <laughs> just because <laughs> I didn't like it, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's understanding that even the greatest and best also have put out work that wasn't necessarily uh, critically acclaimed. Um, so it's that thing that Steph was saying, we, we need to also uh, just uh, give ourselves space to grow and make those mistakes and get better as we go. Um, but also keep in mind that not everyone is gonna get your product. You know, the one thing about the platforms that we have now have access to is that if you're a young movie maker, you have so many tools mm -hmm. that, that that didn't exist a few years back. I mean, a few years back, you couldn't just make a movie with your camera yeah. on your phone mm -hmm. and then post yeah. it all over the world and get people to like it or hate it for that matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Don't they say that? Yeah, but, yes. um, mm. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's also if if you really if you think you're a movie maker then that's a great way to start start posting little TikTok videos or whatever else and see if anybody likes it, um, yeah. you know it's it's a uh, the world has opened up the internet has opened up the world a lot it's it's become a lot smaller with a vast amount of opportunities which is lovely if you're a newcomer yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. there's lots to be said about collaboration. Um, because I, in the world we're living in, and especially in South Africa, I always say South Africa, until you leave, you then realize how far we are from geographically, how far we are from the hubs that we so look up to. Um, so nobody thinks of us. <laughs> we were all the way down on the tip of Africa, right? Um, so you sometimes to to get your work to travel or to get to make work you need to to collaborate with people from locally and people from all around the world to be able to understand what is you know what what can also what you can take from locally to make into a global product and especially for young people who are entering the film space sometimes who you're pen selves together and see who can do what and do it. You just never know where that work will, will end up in future. And even for us, we're on this platform right now, all of us are storytellers, all of us are filmmakers. Imagine what it would be like at this time on Women's Day to have a project with all four of us, in it, right? I think that is a lot of what's missing in South Africa. We don't collaborate with each other 
as much as as we could because we don't know what network I have or what the Red's network is or the ladies' network is. It could be that Sal's network opens a door that none of us had thought of. And it's just the thing that they've been looking for. So I think for me, I think even when the year started, I was like, we need my personal journeys to collaborate more with different people and see where that takes us. Um, that, because that might also be a, here, a nice, I, yes, a nice idea for, for the Gauteng Film Commission and NVF and them to host, start hosting industry network, network. sessions. That's so true. that people like us all get together in the same room, even if we work in different areas of industry and start chatting to each other. Because when we go to markets, we tend to focus on the outside people, the potential distributor, the potential guy on the other side of the ocean. And um, we actually have a great pool of talent. So I think you're onto yeah. something there, Steph, that we should collaborate more. Mm. Can I ask, can I give you, I have like three questions in the chat, right? That um I'll, I'll i'll give to you so if you could answer quickly as quick and as swiftly as possible so one says one how does one get all the jobs or opportunities you've had and i'm not referring to the acting side of it because i've never seen a post advertised in our field so how do you how does one get all these opportunities anybody sometimes it's about creating <laughs> opportunities for yourself for example, if you want to be hired as a script writer, write a script, apply to the NFVF for development funding, find out other people, you know, your application is not successful, find out from other people who've had successful applications. The beauty of the, the system that the NFVF has and BFCs um, and, and, and the KZN Film Commissions is that, you know, they don't hide who they funded. So you are able to try and reach out to them people and find out from them, um, you know, can you assist me? I tried to apply, I didn't make it. Uh, can you give us some pointers? Or, you know, what did you learn? What can you assist me with, etc. cetera? Um, it's about also just doing the homework, doing the research. Don't expect everything to just be handed to you. Sometimes you literally have to create your own job. Do YouTube clips if you're an actor, if you're a writer, you know, find out how other people are getting their stuff made. But most importantly, try to develop your own project and do it as professionally as you can because the tools are. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, another question is, is IP really such a deal breaker? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... <laughs> Yeah, IT, IP is intellectual property. It means if you give that up, it means whatever you thought up does not belong to you anymore. That's in the, the short version. In other words, I'm a creator. I create this beautiful, tremendous TikTok video. It gets 2 million likes, but I signed my IP over to TikTok, which means all the ad revenue goes to TikTok, not to me. And that's basically how industry works. So IP is something you really want to hold on to, or even if just a percentage, and you really can't. Television, you do not. The moment you write and it goes on a screen, it is not yours anymore. They can sell it to Africa. They can sell it to Europe. They can sell it to South America. They can sell it wherever they want. They can rerun it a hundred times. You do not get a cent for it. Also, let's look at the... Mbube story. A few weeks ago, I was watching the documentary on Netflix on Mbube. The South African guy wrote it, signed over his IP to the recording company. Obviously, he didn't know this is what he was doing, nor did he understand what this could mean. And the recording company took it and it got re-recorded a million times by Americans and other people around the world. And with him not getting a cent until when 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 Lion King used the song and his kids so many years later went to a lawyer and said, but our dad wrote this. So it's that. Sal always says to 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 people when they when the IP story comes up that yeah no no when you sign this contract your entire IP falls to us and all you'll get is two hundred thousand or five hundred thousand. And then Sal would say, sure, my daughter is now she's 10. 
that means you are going to keep my, my IP for 20 years. And she can only start making money out of it when she's 30. And how much money is she going to make then? It's that. It's, it's, your, it's, it's, your, it's your legacy. It's, it's creating something that is your legacy and saying, ooh, legacy. Here you go. Go to someone else and I don't need that much from it. Our laws need to change because it doesn't work like that anywhere else in the world, except you. Well, I don't know, but I know this is how it operates in South Africa, which is not fair. And, and it's not to say that we, are holding, we want to hold on to IP. I want to be compensated for my idea. Compensated um, fairly. Hmm. It's not that they don't compensate you. They give you a salary, but they don't say, because you came up with this great thing that I'm now going to make millions off of. Here's your portion of the millions. No, no, no. They, they give you a very small fraction of it and go, there you go. And, and, and it, it's, it's, yeah, like I said, the Mbube story. Lion King made how much from, from just that song? And the family of, of the, the man who wrote that song and sang that song didn't make a fraction of the millions and the billions that they made. So IP is important. It's the beginner. It's the egg. <laughs> yeah. And the chicken. And the chicken and the chi salad. And <laughs> the fried chicken. And the bread you're going to put it on. <laughs> and I think, you know, sometimes, Naledi, as a, as, a, as a young filmmaker entering the industry, you just think, let me just write something. And, and as long as I sell it, as long as I make some money, because sometimes you're desperate. Sometimes you get excited that, ooh, this channel is interested in my work, or ooh, this producer is interested in my work, or you know, you, you get taken over by, oh, I've been struggling so much for so long, or I need money right now, and these people are giving me the money. So in that moment, because of a lack of knowledge, a lot of the time you make the mistake of saying, okay, let me just sign in science just so that I can get my money and sort out my problem. But we're not thinking about what happens 20 years from now when some young filmmaker wants to remake your script and, and the person they have to pay is the channel and not you. How many films have, has, has Hollywood had to make and remake and, and the person who gets paid ha is the person who created it instead of the channel that owns it. So we, it's just, it's a conversation guys that needs to be had for our industry to survive. Otherwise, unfortunately, it, if it continues in the way it's continuing 10, 15, 20 years from now, we will not have an industry to talk of. And I hate to say it, I really do, but it's, it's that it, our future, lies in in our IP and as being compensated we're not trying to keep it or keep all of it we're saying we need to be compensated fairly for it it's also I think the, the new generation has an issue with our with us wanting our IP because they have so many platforms that they can just post stuff on they give mm -hmm. away IP actually for free mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. the difference is that when you just make a little video in your backyard, chances are you're not as good as someone, I hate to say it, but you're not as good as someone who's been in the industry for a while, who has a whole crew behind them, or who has worked on a script for six months or had an editor involved in whatever else. So, so what, we, what we're selling is a professional product, project or product that, is, that has legs, that can travel. Um, a little video shot on a little phone in the backyard some of them are hits yes but they don't have legs they won't travel they won't last beyond six months and that's why ip is so important because it's something that's lasting something that can be recreated something you can build on um so it's important even though a lot of people these days give a lot of stuff away on youtube and everywhere else it's not the mm -hmm. same thing and also sorry just to to add one last thing to to, to this um I was reading a story. Uh, I don't know if you know the, um, I'm sure we all have read about it at least, uh, Hamilton, the theater 
the musical that was on Broadway that then went to the UK and traveled around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the lead actors in Hamilton, I was reading an article and, and he was saying, it, it's a theater musical play, right? And they wanted to film it. They wanted to film the theater version while they are, while they are on stage. And he, and they were not getting paid, like they were not being compensated now for, for this piece of work that was now gonna live in film. They were, I think they were being only compensated for a normal theater run. And he then came back to the producers and said, who, the lead in Wizard of Oz that played two years ago, same vibe, it was a theater musical and it was being filmed to play on television, but they were filming it in theater. How much did you pay that guy? And then they told him and he said, that's how much I want. I don't want even a cent more. I want to get paid the same as the lead of Wizard of Oz. And they found out how much that was. And he says, the day before filming had uh, was to happen, they still hadn't confirmed whether they were gonna give him that money. And his agent asked, why do you want so much money? And he said, this is all I have. All I know how to do is to sing and act. And you want me to give it away for free for, for something that's not gonna live in a different medium forever and ever, film is forever. Baby mamas will be here forever. <laughs> So, and he said, so you want me to, to give away, it's the only talent, it's all I know to do. And you want me to give it away for a very small portion instead of getting paid what I feel is due to me. And never mind what I feel is due to me, what, I, what, what, what you were able to, play, to pay somebody else a few years ago, but you're not willing to pay it to me because I'm a black guy, right? So it's that, it's all we have. It's writing and directing, it's all I know how to do. On that note, right? There's a last question. And I think this is one of the most important questions, right? That uh, right now we are, we are experiencing a very difficult time. We're in the pandemic with COVID-19 and mm -hmm. there won't be home festivals for a while. And so what's the alternative? Like what's, what's the alternative going forward with, all of this happening around us as filmmakers. The alternative to what? To, to making films or mm -hmm. set and having production value that we had before because of limitations that we have, I think. I think that's where the person is going, right? Because now you must have a certain number of people on set. And so, so how, how creative wise, you know, our, our creative side, how do we move forward with, with all of this happening and still making making films. Steph, no. I think you can yeah. also advise on this. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a tricky question, uh, but but we're in the business of being creative. We are creative people. We will find a way. You you will we will start shooting films that need a smaller crew, a smaller amount of actors if we have to. We'll we'll start telling stories on one set if we have to. We'll find ways around it, I think. Um, we'll have to. The, the film industry as such, the big screens, I think will suffer. Um, they, but you know what? I hate to say it, but that's been a long time coming. Uh, the online platforms have been slowly edging forward and pushing the dinosaurs, like the films that we all love, to the back, to the back. And I don't think they'll ever disappear, but it's become becoming a niche market. I might be wrong. I don't know if anybody disagrees with me. But um, we just have to adapt, and we will. We will. It's our nature. I mm. think on that note, with, with, with our film, Letters of Hope, it was supposed to be in cinemas on the 20th of May. Right, and then COVID happened in March, yeah. and it was a bummer because it's a first feature. You're like, oh my god, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be I, on IMDb. You know, we would have been critically acclaimed. We would have, we would have, right? And and that is a serious setback, and that's money lost as well, yeah. right? Because that's a market. It's money on the left on the table. Yes, so it's gone. So now you have to now find alternative ways of, 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 of getting something out of this film. So I think going forward, 
uh, with our industry and making films within this pandemic is that we can't give up now, right? And we still need to tell the stories that we need to tell. Now there's Netflix, they, they are accessible. I think, you know, Disney's coming to Africa. It's access, there's, there's access now. Now they, they, there's a lot of people, you know, looking for content and we can do a direct um, uh, interaction without the middleman. So I think as much as COVID has affected us, we, it has actually opened another door of opportunities. So now we know everybody's looking for content and it's now out in the open, you know, they put it acquisitions, they just put it out to say, we're looking for content in Africa. And now it's your chance to come forward, right? And before it wouldn't have been like that. We know it, 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 it would have taken a little bit longer to get there. So I think moving forward in our spaces, just to see, ah, now there's Netflix, now there's Disney, now there's this, now there's Showmax, now there's, and we can actually now go directly to these people. I think that's what COVID has done for us. Any last piece of advice that you'd like to give to our young females moving into our industry? Uh, Doretta? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> In the animation, so animation, animation is, you know, animation is a fascinating growing industry and it's, it's very, very small still. And um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities opening up there worldwide. And I don't mean you have to compete with Disney and America. And like Steph said earlier, we, we tend to think the only people we need to compete with are the huge, big Americans. We don't. There are a lot of industries around the world that we can compete with and in animation the same. VR, which is virtual reality, is growing. So if there's anybody out there who's great at drawing, great at creating characters, great at creating stories, that's good for that. They should explore it and uh, try and get in. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Salamina, last words? Um, don't give up. Uh, it's very important. Um, don't get discouraged uh, because the barriers to entry um, are, are so high. Um, and also you know, ask, ask the network. Um, you know, do the research, get out there, um, don't uh, operate in a silo. Um, you'll always remain small that way. You know, there are people who are open to collaborating um, and, and it's important that you arm yourself with as much knowledge as possible. Steph? Yeah. I think I'll say two things. One, um, again, I am a realistic person. The industry is very tough. Because sometimes I think we, we, you know, when we have these big dreams, you oh, I'm going to be a this, I'm going to be a that. <laughs> And then you don't realize the amount of work that you put in, right? So that's one. It is hard. So when it starts getting hard for you, don't think it's you. It is not you. It is the industry. And the second thing I'd like to say is, you, if if you in if you want to follow this as a path, as a career path and you've already made the decision and you've put in the work, don't let anyone make you feel like you, you don't belong here. You belong here. Your talent is unique. You do bring something to the table. Do not be made to feel like you, you're disposable or you're not enough. Whatever you, when you open your mouth, it might, I mean, sometimes it might not be the right thing to say in terms of ideas, or it might not be an idea that people end up using, but it might be an idea that leads them to something else that they'll use. So speak up, don't be scared of your voice. Your voice matters and your voice counts. And yes, you'll get no's, but you'll also get yeses. So those are my, my stories things. are important, yep. Yeah. Yes, our, our stories are very important. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you so much, ladies. I even took 15 minutes extra of your time. And you were patient and you were great. And you've given great tips to 
females out there. So one last question is then, what does Women's Day mean to you? And then I can close up. So what does Women's Day mean to you? Steph, are you here? Yes, sure, Women's Day, right? It's probably one, Women's Day and Freedom Day are probably my two favorite South African holidays um, because they remind me and, and who, of who I am and, and, and the people who came before me, especially Women's Day because of the women who marched to the union buildings. But also what it means for me is, is what I said earlier is that all the events that have happened have ensured that today my voice matters. Everything that has happened has allowed me to be able to have this conversation with you and with these wonderful women, but to also be able to say no when I mean no and yes when I mean yes, because somebody died, somebody sacrificed their time, their family, their lives for me to be able to have this, this life that I have today. So. Thank you to, to everyone who, who has been a part of our history and, and fought to make sure we have this day. Salamina. So I, um, I, I want to answer that question with a quote that I found yesterday. It says, how do I define an inspiring woman? For me, an inspiring woman is simply a woman who can fill somebody with the desire or the urge to do something worthwhile. That's something that creates a better world for others. It's a woman who appreciates life with everything it has got to offer. So the reason I like that quote is because for me, that's what Women's Day is about. It's about understanding that there are so many amazing, amazing women around me. And it's so important that we celebrate each other um, and that I allow myself to be inspired by their walks, their experience, their journeys, their stories. That's, that for me is what Women's Day allows. It, it's like a day where, you know, for me, it's like I shouldn't only do it on Women's Day, but it's that instant reminder that today, today I will go out of my way to look for those examples of women who touch me on the daily. And I want to celebrate them today. Thank you. Uh, Doretta? Um, to me, it's a reminder that women are game changers. Yeah. We change the world. We change the rules We, if we apply ourselves. So I think it's important that each of us do that. And Women's Day reminds me. It makes me look at myself and go, are you doing that? Are you changing the game? And that's it. Hmm. thank you so much and to close off i'd like to say again guys happy women's day thank you so much for your time for tuning in asking questions interacting with us and actually speaking out i think this was one of the honest uh talks i've done you know it, it is it's very real it's not it's not superficial you know, uh, it's a real realistic staff, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and it was quite, it was, it, it was quite a beautiful, it was a beautiful time, right? I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I think we opened day one of Women's Month masterclasses on a really high note. Um, the comments are very encouraging. Everybody who tuned in loved it. Everybody's sending their love to you. They say good luck for all your future endeavors. And yeah, so thank you for your time. And to the GFC, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's very rare. You know, I think COVID as well has helped us mm. to be mm -hmm. more interactive as filmmakers, to be more accessible to people. Yeah. The other day I was looking for director on Instagram. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, bad, I'm bad with Instagram. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> but today you are very accessible. Those who wanted to ask questions, they could. So I think, I think, you know, COVID, as much as it's impacted us in a negative way, it has also brought us very closer to each other as humans. So very, very well done, guys. Thank you so much for your time. And the GFC, these classes will be happening 
until the 18th of August. So guys, please, please, please stay tuned on all the GFC social platforms to see and to learn and to spend more time with the most amazing filmmakers in South Africa to engage with right, on these platforms. So this is the opportunity for that. This is the time. So thank you so much and happy Women's Day, everybody. Thank, thank you, Naledi, and thank you. Thanks, Cheers. <laughs>